it's a balance that you have to find between having enough novel content and knowing which users like more novel content and which users prefer to hear the same old songs. You're listening to Gradient Descent, a show about machine learning in the real world. And I'm your host, Lucas Bewald. Philip is a scientist at Pandora working on recommender systems. Before that, he was a PhD student working on deep neural networks for acoustic and language modeling applied to musical audio recordings. Amelia Naibaki is a software engineer at Pandora where she runs a team responsible for the production system that serves models to listeners. I'm super excited to talk to both of them. Yeah, maybe I could start by asking at Pandora, what do the machine learning models actually do and how would a Pandora user experience the results of the models? Well, we're a big company, so like Sirius and and Pandora, we have a lot of different models that are spread across all the you know product features. Almost every product in, in almost every digital product has some science background or some science model uh, powering it. So we have like internal for content understanding. We have advertising models. We have, of course, our main feature in, at Pandora are recommendations. We have a lot of work done in recommendations and figuring out which songs to play next. And of course, like having so many models interact with each other makes it you know, quite a complicated scenario. So we need really powerful and strong engineering to make everything work smoothly and to prevent outages and stuff like that. So my work mainly focuses on the musical side. So I work for basically the algorithmic programming team that focuses on you know, creating the radio experience. And I, what I do is compute you know, similarities between artists or tracks. So given this track, which tracks are similar and so on. And like working at Pandora is like the best place to do that because we have like this awesome data that nobody else really has. So we employ a, a lot of music analysts who listen to, who really listen to the songs and annotate them manually. So this is like the dream of every PhD student in this field, like, oh, wow, I have actually experts looking at, at the data and annotating them. And also, like, our users provide us feedback. And over time, like, we collected over 100 billion thumbs up or thumbs down, like, ratings, if users like the song or not. So we have very detailed and strong features on one side and very nice explicit feedback by users on the other side. This is like the perfect scenario to create very, very powerful models. Do you have, a, you have a model that's sort of explicitly trying to understand the similarities between songs? Yeah, exactly. That's like one of my uh, projects I worked on last year. Basically, like this model connects, like we, we had that all from the beginning, like a model that tries to understand which is which songs are similar. But of course, now with the deep learning revolution, <laughs> we try to replace uh, the old models with more sophisticated neural networks that try to take the features we get from the music analysts and map them to what people think like what people think about similarity because it's not obvious like which musical features actually make a song sound similar right is it the tempo is it the mood and by using machine learning we're able to stop thinking about that and just make the computer do this <laughs> this work for us <laughs> i guess as a fan of music myself, I really wonder what the similarity really means, right? Like you probably long ago when you were famous for having all these annotators, you probably had to really think deeply about what similarity really means. Like, do you have a definition in your head of what makes two songs similar or not similar? I don't know. It's, it's, it's very hard to pinpoint that, right? When Pandora started, I don't know, like maybe a million better when it started, it's like 2000 and something. Something like that's that. That's when I yeah. first started to, <laughs> yeah, to hear yeah. about it. Yeah. So back then, what people would do is just compute like distances manually. They would take like the features and weight them, and like manually create like an algorithm that uh, tells us what's similar and what not. And they would look how like the lists look like. And this is like bootstrapping from nothing, right? Mm -hmm. But gradually, of course, we collected more and more feedback. We can replace that just by using models and we don't have to think about that that hard so we have an idea how this works which i obviously share but, <laughs> but like it turns out that if you run a model on that it's it figures out a little bit better than humans could do before i guess i would imagine though like one definition of similarity would just be like 
these two songs, like people that like one song, like the other song. Is that how you think of similarity or is it somehow deeper than that? Like these two songs are fundamentally similar songs. Like I would think like a person who likes kind of one recent top 40 song might like another recent top 40 song, but they might be totally different genres. So then does your model try to say these two songs are similar or not similar or what, what does it do in that case? Like we are more focused on like this radio experience, right? So you have like you select a, like an artist, for example, or a track to start a radio from. Mm -hmm. And this is like maybe a more direct or specific way to define similarity. It's basically similarity is what kind of songs I can play on that radio. So mm -hmm. if a person likes like top, like charts music, they won't want to listen to, I don't know, some hip hop song on their, I don't know, dance radio, right? So it's, we don't have to, in this case, we don't have to model like the taste of a user, although we do that, of course, for other, for other things. But in terms of music similarity, we really think like, okay, how, which songs can, I, can we play on this radio station? So I would think that your model would need to look at both the sort of like musical elements of the song and kind of other things, right? Because our culture kind of affects our sense of similarity. Like what, what other things does your model look at besides uh, just the, the audio of the, the song? Well, it's just as Emilia said, we have different models for different aspects of this, of this whole musical experience, right? So we have models that are just based on the musical features. We have models that are just based on the audio. And this is like special because it, when you do recommendations, everybody, no matter if it's like Netflix or, or Pandora or whatever, you, you have like this long tail of unknown items that nobody really like, few people have listened to them. So we can't really understand from user interactions who would like them. So this is like the way we deal with that. We go from the content, from like audio or from musical features. But for items that, or for songs where we already gathered a lot of feedback, it's easy for us to just do the classic thing. Oh, somebody like this and this song, they're similar to you. So maybe you also like them. So depending like if a song is very popular or not, we can uh, then different recommenders work better or worse. Got it. And so what happens when the model improves? Like how would I as like a, a user of your product experience a better model? Would I notice like when you put out a new version that does better recommendations? Well, we notice, right? <laughs> because we just, we, <laughs> <laughs> we have a very powerful like AP testing framework that Amelia works a lot with, right? And when we create a new model and we add it to our ensemble of recommenders or we improve one of the models, we just deploy it very quickly in an A-B test. And after a few hours, we already get like results. So we see like, oh, people thumb up more or people spend more time listening. And Amita worked a lot of with these A-B tests, right? So you know uh, a lot about that. Yeah, I would expect that you personally would not notice other than oh, Pandora has been really getting it right today. <laughs> nice. um, yeah, but we see things like listeners are thumbing more in one or another direction. They're spending more time on Pandora. They're, I don't know, creating more stations. We have a bunch of different things we can look at to see how we're affecting listener behavior. Okay, so maybe let's get a little more technical for our audience. I do have a zillion questions as a Pandora user, but the point of this is supposed to be around how you actually make these models. So do you actually like chain these models together? It sounds like you take the output of a lot of these different models and then use all those outputs to make decisions in your application. Yeah, absolutely. Everyone kind of talks about this scenario where like one model changes and it has unintended consequences. Like how, how do you deal with that? Like all the models connected together. That's a good question. One of the ways that we use models is during our song recommendation pipeline. The ensemble recommender system proposes a set of candidate songs and passes them to a microservice that handles the real-time evaluation of a machine learning model. And that machine learning model is like our larger overarching model that figures out how the other models are informing the decision. Did that, did that. Let me see if I can repeat it back to you okay, and tell me if I, if I got this right. So it sounds like you have an ensemble model or kind of several models that take into account different things, like maybe the actual audio quality of the song. And you mentioned sort of like non-audio features of the, the song, and it proposes several songs that you might 
play next. And then you have another model that runs as like a microservice that looks at those options and maybe takes into account more things and decides the actual specific song that gets played. Yeah, that's exactly right. And some of the features coming into the that final model are from the previous models, the, the models from the ensemble recommender. Do you have to retrain the microservice every time you deploy a new model upstream of it? I can tell you that the model that the microservice uses is retrained every day. So oh, wow. with fresh data and we have validation that runs to make sure that our results aren't totally wacky before we actually <laughs> upload it to the right. microservice. Yeah. And we, we have like daily reports that show us maybe like like feature importances and the average value. So we can keep an eye on how the model is changing day to day. And the nice thing about that is, that, for example, when I deployed my, my, my recommendation system last year, it's like addictive because you look at the numbers like every few, every day and like, oh yeah, it got that many, like I, I recommended that many songs and people liked it that much. It's, it's really nice how, how easy that works. You just add a new model and after like uh, you wait a bit and you like the microservice pulls them in and selects them and it's, it's, it's really cool. <laughs> And I guess, what do you use to keep track of all the, the versions? This is something a lot of our users are asking us all the time. Like, how do you version your models and version the data that the models are trained on? How do you think about that? Yeah, that's everybody asks that because it's a very hard problem, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> so if you could walk me through as much detail as you can, how you do that, because I'm sure a lot of people are, are wondering. <laughs> yeah. For code, it's pretty easy, right? Everybody uses Git and we use Git for basically everything. And we have like our own you know, instance of, of, of a product that we use and all the, all the code that trains the models and all the code that runs in production is on the server. Model versions, training, tracking model versions is way more difficult, especially during during development, right? Because you run a lot of experiments, you try to compare them. What we did until recently, we just like everybody wrote their own libraries that you stored the config somewhere, computed hashes, and you know, so you can track back if you want to find something. But that's a pain. <laughs> that was really a pain. <laughs> I would have like a an experiments directory where I had like 200 subdirectories with <laughs> different experiments. And I would have another like Google sheet somewhere that stores the names of the important experiments so I can know which models to use when I want to deploy them. And yeah, since we use now, since we use weights and biases, this got way, way easier because we just like lock our experiments. We can filter them easily. We can compare them very easily. It's like we store, for example, the, the learned weights there and just pull them when we need to. And we decide, okay, this is the model we want to go with. We just download the, <laughs> the model and, and that's it. So it's like all the keeping track of models during development is, is gotten much easier through that. I'm so glad to hear that. I appreciate the, the weights and biases shout out, uh, but <laughs> not trying to make this only about <laughs> weights and biases. I guess, you know, another question we get all the time is like, what are the other tools that you use day to day to make your life easier as a machine learning a practitioner. So I think this is like more about like the development part, like where we create the model, we we, we train and uh, and like we look at the data and yep. try to figure out what to do. Almost everybody I, I work with, we use IntelliJ for development because it's just like this one IGE that that rules them all. It has all the <laughs> languages. Like we mostly work with Python for the experiments, and then once we're done, we either use you know python with pyspark or or scala with spark to deploy the the, the code in production and like with intellij all of this gets so much easier because it, it speaks all these languages it has very nice plugins to connect to google cloud this is like the service we're we're using for almost anything now we switched like a few months ago and then also made our lives much easier there's plugins that where you can connect to to a data proc cluster and inspect all the, the database schemas and tables and you get column completion when you write your SQL statements that just like that. So incredible. The first time I saw that, I was like, wow, this changes <laughs> everything. <laughs> 
So yeah, mostly IntelliJ. Also, a very nice thing is like the remote debugging feature. You don't have to log in with SSH in your to your training server and try to debug in the command line. You just have like a visual debugger. You can inspect the variables in there and run the code remotely still. So it's pretty strong to for me and makes my life much easier. Can you talk a little bit about how you debug models? This is another question everyone has. Can you? Walk me through oh, yeah. your process a little bit when when that goes wrong and actually the, the performance <laughs> goes down. What do you what do you do? <laughs> well, then it's just like going through the code and tracing back what you changed and what might have caused the problem. But I think it's more important to never come to this point. And you do that <laughs> by well, I, I try to do that by being a slow starter. So I don't try to write the most complex model uh, like right from the mm -hmm. start. But we'll start slowly first, get like some of the data. And then I try to make sure the data makes sense. So I try to select a small model, try to overfit the model on the small data set. Is it possible? I change like, for example, I randomize the features to make sure that there is, for example, no problem with, with uh, train test splits or if the model, you know, actually produces garbage when I put garbage in because that should happen, right? There's right. a very nice blog post by Andre Karpathy, like on that topic is called a recipe for training neural networks. And he, like, he's pretty good at what he's doing. So I'm just trying to follow this recipe as, as good, good as I can, like making sure you understand the data, making actually sure that you don't evaluate something that you don't care about. So you should make sure that the numbers you get actually reflect what you want to see in the end. And yeah, that's basically it. Just being very defensive with your development and checking things again and again. It's difficult to debug uh, models because there is no right way. And if you make a bug in your neural network training code, it will still mostly work. It's not like it will crash and burn. It will work, but worse. Right. Do you have any bugs that come to mind as, <laughs> as particularly difficult or, or ones that you, you've struggled with for a long time? <laughs> I was training an embedding network that uses the triplet loss mm -hmm. and you have to select like positives and negatives, right? And my, the data was stored as a sparse matrix. So you had like a matrix, which items are connected to which is a ground truth. Uh -huh. So it's very easy to understand which positives to sample for a given item because there's a one in the, in the matrix. Wait, sorry, I'm not an expert in the space. What, what does a one mean here? That they're connected. Say, say for example, you have tracks and which ones are, say, for example. Uh -huh. But the problem was that when you mask that, because when you do a train test, you have to mask that, that matrix so you don't use any data from the test set in, in your training set. Uh -huh. But the problem then is that you don't know whether a zero, like a no entry means that it's masked because it's in a different split or whether I see. there is actually no connections. What ended up happening is that I didn't sample all the negatives that were possible. And this, of course, makes your training harder because you don't get, you don't, you're not using only all, all the data. Yeah. And finding that out was pretty, like pretty tough because it still works. Right. <laughs> All right. So maybe this is a question for both of you, actually. But I, this is a question that comes up a lot that people always want me to ask is, how do you communicate the progress you're making with the non-technical people outside of your team, but in the company? At least for the system that I'm working on, we have weekly meetings with our PM who communicates up the ladder. <laughs> we occasionally, end of year, maybe end of quarter, will present to the broader product organization what changes we've been making and how they've been affecting our core metrics. I think yeah. sometimes people tell me that they have this experience where like other teams are kind of working on engineering projects with sort of like add these features that are very visible, but the stuff that both of you are working on can feel more like experimental and there can be like long periods of time where the experiments aren't working and that can be frustrating. Is that consistent with your experience or, or not? Well, luckily, our direct managers, at least in my case, I think in the science department, every manager used to be a scientist in his previous life. So, so they know how science works and you can make a lot of progress in a few weeks and you can be stuck for a month and just iterate an experiment and nothing really works. 
the good thing is because of all this, you know, infrastructure we have, the microservice Amelia was talking about, and we can actually trace back every thumb or every song of somebody liked to all the individual models. So in the end, we, after like, say every quarter of a year, we can actually put a number on how many more thumbs we get because of this contribution and how many more time, how much more time people actually spend up listening uh, to Pandora. And since Pandora is a ad-based like a uh, service that translates uh, very well to money. <laughs> sure. That makes sense. Okay. Another question for both of you is how do you think about tuning and improving your models? Like, do, do you do that kind of hyper parameter search that a lot of people talk about, or is it more intuitive or is it more structured? Yeah, I think like when it comes to hyperparameter search, it's like a hybrid, right? Because we deal with similar problems all the time. Oftentimes we already have like a good guess what kind of how the model should look like to get reasonable results. And this is most of the time, this is just like where I start. I will just try a, like five different configurations to see how big or how small I can go. And then just settle with a model that works well enough. And that's it. And then I just like keep iterating on different things like, okay, which kind of other features can I use? Can I pull other data and uh, integrate it somehow? And once all of this is done, once I'm like quite confident, okay, this is like the, the structure, the model structure that we'll probably work with. These days with weights and biases, we just, <laughs> just like create this hyperparameter sweep. You don't have to change anything in your code. You start it on the Friday, it runs for, for over the weekend or longer, depending on, on the size of the model, and then you're done. So it's, it just saves a lot of headache if you can run this automatically and, and without much thinking. And so you spend most of your time, it sounds like, thinking about more data you could get or different features you could try than, than the hyperparameters? Most of the time, yeah, honestly, because that's where... This is like a difference between like working at academia when I was doing my PhD and, and actually working in industry because in academia you have like, okay, this is the data set that's the standard in this field. You take it and you try to like improve, you try to create a new method or whatever. But at uh, an industry like at Pandora, it's like, okay, we want to solve that problem. Here is all the data we have, solve it. <laughs> so you have to think about, okay, which data makes sense, what kind of data makes sense to use, which biases would that induce when I use that data. So thinking about which data to use, how to clean it up, because that's a big problem. Data is, of course, if you work with real data, you have outliers, you have some problems here and there. I spend a lot of t much more time thinking about data since I started working in industry than, than before, definitely. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe let's talk a little more about production. Amelia, I mean, you started to talk about the microservices, but I'd love to hear more about how you actually serve the models in production. Yeah, we're generating our production models in GCP, and then we upload them to Redis, which is a key value store. And that's where the microservice could read them. And then to avoid having to go to Redis every time we need a model, we stash them in a guava cache on Heap because at least the models that I work with, we're using them every time there's a request for more songs on a listener station. So that's so often. Are these deep learning models or simpler? I think like the model you're talking about, the microservice is not because just because it has to serve a lot of requests real time. So you just can't afford to run a complicated deep learning model at this point. Like the recommenders in the ensemble, there are a few deep learning models there, of course. But for the final selection of the track, it's, I think the models provide enough features and enough candidates to just have a simpler model like that. Ah, oh, cool, cool. I see. So there's sort of like bigger models that run in batch mode where they don't have to be real time. Is that right? And then the final model you talked about has to do real time, so it's lighter weight. Yeah, yeah. And we definitely have had the experience. We've tried like increasing the size of the model and had to pull that back because it wasn't performant enough. Definitely performance is, is something that we're always keeping in mind. We it don't want the user to wait around. So what are the hard parts about getting that model into production? What, what are the day-to-day -day challenges? Yeah, efficiency is the biggest thing that I worry about, that latency again. We're always trying out 
new changes, things like Philip mentioned, like adding new features. Sometimes we'll try partitioning listeners in a different way. So sending different listeners to different models or changing the size of the model. And sometimes those changes will look really promising offline, but then we try it in production and we'll see that it's too costly computationally. Yeah, the, we're getting hundreds of thousands of requests every minute. We got to be super fast. Have you? I'm curious, have you always been deploying a new model every day or is that a new process for you? For the last couple of years, we've been doing that every day. Occasionally we'll skip days if we don't pass validation that day and then somebody will go and look and make sure that it's reasonable or, or see if we need to make changes. But yeah, we're staying pretty up to date. And what, I guess, what causes that? Do do the songs change every day or the, the songs people like change every day? Songs can change every day. Yeah, I think mostly we just want to make sure like we have the, the latest data, like the latest thumbs, the latest completion rates, the latest way that listeners are reacting to songs. I see. So I guess you sort of don't have to worry as much about kind of data drift because you're retraining every day on, on the latest data. Yeah, I suppose that that's less of an issue for the particular model that I'm working with. Do you have a production monitoring place for that model? Do you look for signals that bad things might be happening? We certainly have dashboards that monitor things like like number of requests and, and latencies and CPU thread counts, things like that. But mainly the way that we, we monitor things are those A-B tests mm. where we're pretty confident that our control model is pretty darn good. Any changes that we're making, we're comparing against the control model. I see. How many, how many A-B tests, order of magnitude, how many A-B tests can you run in parallel? I'm, I'm jealous of how many users you have. It must be amazing to, <laughs> to get that data. Yeah, our particular group is running tens, probably, maybe hundreds if you look at our, our broad product area, and then I think thousands if if you're looking at the whole company. Wow. Is it tricky to swap models in and out in production, or is that simple for you? It's simple mechanically. We can just overwrite the value in the cache, but in practice, we're a lot more careful. We we always run an A-B test. We never swap anything in without sure, making sure. sure that it's moving metrics in the right way and not degrading the experience for the users. But yeah, mechanically, it's really simple. Can you talk about how you take a model, like the steps that you go through from taking a model from like experimental to it's the model that's blessed as the one that runs by default in production? I can speak of the recommendation models that we use for stations, and that's actually also not that complicated because in the end, what you do is you you experiment with the model, and then at some point, say you you think, okay, this is the model I want to use. So then, what I would do is just translate that model into like an Airflow uh, deck where it can run weekly or daily or however often I, I think it's necessary. And in the easiest case, I would just produce a table on GCP with recommendations. Mm -hmm. And this table gets then pulled just by, I'll just ping an engineer and say, hey, there is a new model around, <laughs> look at this table. And they will uh, pull it into this ensemble where all the candidates are are being pull pulled together. And for a certain number of users, the microservice will then pick songs by that by that model. And we'll just in the beginning, it's just a very small percentage, of course. So we don't like we don't throw uh, this new model at uh, all the users because we don't know how it behaves, right? So we would then say try it on one percent of the users and observe the, the numbers. Do they like the new recommendations? Do they thumb up songs recommended by this track, by this recommender? And also, does it make sense to add this recommender to, be, to the ensemble at all? Because maybe the, the it recommends awesome songs, but nothing, it doesn't add anything to, to the mix. And that's basically it. And then it's in production. <laughs> 
Okay, well, we always end with these questions. I'd love for both of you to weigh in if you feel comfortable. The first one is, what's an underrated aspect of machine learning that you think people should pay more attention to than they do? Uh, well, the thing that I always like think of is not that, maybe not that directly technically related to machine learning, but in general, it's like ethics and uh, like diversity and equality. That's our, that's like a topic that, comes up sometimes now in machine learning and it's getting more prominent, but I still don't think it, it's it's enough because we are just creating all these models that do very s seemingly smart stuff, but we never, like few people actually look at, okay, what are the consequences of, of, of these things? And some, even some figureheads from academia and industry, they say, you know, oh, there's like the models, they're not biased. We don't really have to care that much about that because the models just, they're neutral. And it's kind of right, right? The model has no bias, but it learns the bias from training data. And the training data we use is like stuff that's happening right now or that happened the last 10, 20 years. So what the model learns is to like reproduce that bias. And I don't see a way to really tackle that from a data perspective, just because like, let's take the new GPT-3 model, the, the language model by developed by OpenAI was trained on 410 billion tokens. How do you change the training data in a way that it doesn't produce, I don't know, gender bias or racial bias? It's like, it's impossible, I think. I think we have to think very carefully about how we use these models and how can we integrate some way of human decision-making in the whole process and not just blindly trust whatever the model says. Can um, I ask, does that come up at Pandora? Like, I feel like you have in some ways, and it's really wonderful kind of fun application of machine learning. And maybe you're one of the few places where there might be less ethical concerns. I can imagine some, but do you think about it day to day? Well, the reason why I got into music and machine learning is that very reason, because it's just a very, I know, it's hard to do bad things in, in, in music, but actually we have some discussions about that. For example, let me give you like two examples. One is what we call popularity bias. So it's known that basically all recommendation models suffer from popularity bias, meaning that it, they, they recommend popular items more often. And most of them actually recommend popular items more often than their popularity would suggest. So it's even like they even strengthen, uh, they reinforce the whole thing. Right, because it's like a safe choice maybe? Exactly. It's actually quite hard to beat a recommender that just plays the most popular songs. Right, right. Looking just at the numbers. So we have some functionality included in our, maybe not in the individual models, but at the end we try to diversify artists like we try to boost artists that are not very popular because it basically helps everybody it helps the user to find new artists it helps the artists to to get more exposure that they wouldn't, wouldn't get otherwise and so it's a, i think it's a good thing to do <laughs> basically Plus, some of the recommenders, as I said, are just looking purely at the musical information, right? So what, how does the song sound like? Or how does, like, what characteristics the analysts annotate it? This is just a way to try songs that don't have much feedback data and are hard to recommend otherwise. And another thing that we, like, recently started discussing and we intend to explore that further is we found that for some genre stations, we have a very in imbalanced distribution between male and female artists. And of course, like nobody at Pandora decided to make, I don't know, make the country radio only play male artists. But this is what, what just happened because we look at what people listen to, right? And we, all, we always will always take care that every listener gets what they want to listen to. So if somebody just likes hearing male voices, they will just get male artists. And if somebody just likes female voices, they will get female artists. But 
we, we we're discussing about how can we how can we create a better balance of like new female artists pushing them more in this kind of in these scenarios where where we have a strong imbalance here. Well, that's really cool, Amelia. Do you have any thoughts on that topic? I really appreciate that Philip is thinking about it. I have noticed that the music that I tend to like is male artists, but I, as a woman, would like to support female artists and I would like to be able to find female artists that I enjoy. And I would like to see that promotion of female artists happen in Pandora. We do things like like in the product that will try to offset some of that imbalance. For instance, during Women's History Month last year, we created personalized playlists for our premium users that were only female artists. My playlist was very good. <laughs> nice. We should uh, share it in the uh, yeah. in the show notes. <laughs> uh, yeah, and we do things. We do things too, like like Black History Month. We had some personalized, I think, Pandora stories that we shared out. Yeah, so we're definitely trying to make a small bit of difference in that bias. This is a pretty broad question, but do you have any thoughts on, I feel like sometimes these recommendation systems and machine learning in general kind of gets a knock for sort of optimizing for our reptile brains. I could see that with Pandora maybe wanting in the short term to hear the same songs over and over, but in a more, I don't know, higher brain sense like wanting to be exposed to new music do either of you think about that day to day do you feel like it's possible to over optimize for a thumbs up or a listen times definitely yeah but it's something that we always have in mind so of course like the direct metrics are time spent listening and so on but we definitely hear users saying okay there's just too much repetition and then we just try to, this is something that's very hard to measure in a very direct way. And what Amelia said is that if you just blindly reduce repetition, because it's an easy thing to do, it tends to annoy some people. It's a balance that you have to find between having enough novel content and knowing which users like more novel content and which users prefer to hear the same old songs all the time. So it's definitely something that we have to keep in mind and we do. Yeah, one of the things uh, that we're doing in the product too, related to that specific question is the modes. So if you're on like an artist station and you're getting tired of your normal station experience and you're really wanting to get some new stuff in there, you can go into discovery mode and you'll get some really fresh songs but then when you get tired of hearing new stuff because that's sort of exhausting like constantly having new content thrown at you you can go back to your old experience awesome well the final question and we're running out of time but i want to make sure i ask it is so what's the biggest challenge of actually getting machine learning models deployed in the real world from the beginning of the kind of conception of it to actually in people's hands giving them better music. Where are the surprising bottlenecks? Well, I think we talked about that a little bit already. For me, coming from academia, it was that, first of all, different things, like you, you approach the problem from, from a different point of view because before you just have the, the data set and you try to improve the model, even if it's just by like one percentage point, percentage point accuracy, and now you, it's more like you have a problem and you first, the first step is to find the data that solves that problem. So you have like this huge data store and okay, well, how can I find the data that solves the problem? Then you like develop a model, which is pretty similar. And then at some point you have to ask yourself, so when is the model good enough? Because you can always keep on tuning. This is like science, right? So you can just keep on improving forever. And here the difference is of course that like one or two percentage points improvement in academia gets you a new paper. In, in industry, it might not even matter because the, the impact on the end user is so small because you have like a hundred other recommenders in the ensemble. And then for me, the hardest part was to to just let it go at some point and just say, okay, this is it. That's, that's enough. For me, I 
totally already mentioned this, but the biggest challenge is always making sure your machine learning model is performant enough to make predictions in real time. I think during the research phase of development, you can focus on the accuracy of predictions without worrying a ton about the latency of the predictions. But um, in production, the prediction latency has to be low enough that a user isn't waiting around for results. So there's definitely a balance there between um, the effectiveness of a model and the efficiency of a model. I mean, spoken like someone who really has models in production. <laughs> it's, it's so great to talk to both of you. I really appreciate it. That was super fun. I feel so proud that we could help you guys. <laughs> At Weights and Biases, we make this podcast, Gradient Descent, to learn about making machine learning work in the real world. But we also have a part to play here. We are building tools to help all the people that are on this podcast make their work better and make machine learning models actually run in production. And if you're interested in joining us on this mission, we are hiring in engineering, sales, growth, product, and customer support. And you should go to wmb.me slash hiring and check out our job postings. We'd love to talk about working with you.